from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. The free peoples of the world look to us for support in maintaining their freedoms. If we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world. By 1948, former allies were locked in a fierce battle for land and influence in a recovering Europe. With tensions rising, the destroyed city of Berlin became the first battleground in the new Cold War, and the U.S. chose to stand up for their former bitter enemies in the hopes of spreading freedom, democracy, and lasting peace in Germany and Europe. On May 7, 1945, at the close of World War II, Germany's surrender marked an Allied victory in the European theater. After nearly six years of violence and destruction, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union had defeated Germany, their hated enemy. The decision to divide Germany among the four victorious powers had been approved by Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin at the Yalta Conference in February 1945. That June, the Allies agreed to share the occupation of the German capital city of Berlin, which was located roughly 100 miles inside of the Soviet sector of Germany. Berlin was a destroyed city. Uh, we had bombed it into oblivion during World War II, particularly 44 and 45. And then the Soviet army had uh, leveled what was left. But Germany was not the only country hurt by World War II. The Soviets were completely devastated by the Second World War, right, both in terms of the number of people that were killed, right, so somewhere between 26 and 30 million Soviets were killed during the Second World War. Um, uh, if you compare it to the United States, in two fronts, um, somewhere around 400,000, so just in terms of the scale of, of suffering, um, not to mention the economic devastation that was experienced by the, by the Second World War. The Soviet Union sought to prolong the economic distress of Germany, attempting to create conditions that would lend themselves to seizure by a strong communist government. But the U.S. had a different objective. They believed that an economically strong Germany with a stable currency would be able to develop into a strong democracy and not be forced under communist control. On June 22, 1948, at a quadripartite meeting in Berlin, the Soviet Union insisted that the currency of West Berlin not differ from that of East Germany. The next day, the Western Allies announced that the Deutschmark would become the new currency of West Germany and West Berlin. So one side of a city, one side of a country has their own very stable currency, and the other side has money that's actually worth nothing. As you can imagine, that's a problem. On June 24th, the Soviet Union imposed a blockade of the road, rail, and water routes into West Berlin. With over two million West Berliners cut off from vital resources, President Truman was faced with a difficult decision. Abandon the city to Soviet control and, as the Christian Science Monitor published that week, snuff the candle of light east of the Iron Curtain and set ablaze new fires of communism to the west, or remain in the city that General Lucius Clay, administrator of U.S.-occupied Germany, called a symbol of the American intent. President Truman agreed with General Clay, stating, we stay in Berlin, period. While post-war agreements kept the Western Allies from the rights to ground access into and out of West Berlin, a 1945 written document creating three air corridors through which the Western Allies could enter West Berlin was unarguable. Operation Vittles was initiated by the U.S. on June 26, 1948, and two days later, the British joined the effort with the launch of Operation Plainfair. The Berlin airlift had begun. They started to send uh, planes like every day. There were like 100 uh, planes every day. And they needed everything. They needed coal, they needed fuel, they needed like um, mostly food. A resolution from the U.S. House of Representatives recognizing the 60th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift's success stated that the East German press called the mission the futile attempts of Americans to save face and to maintain their untenable position in Berlin. But the Soviet Union did not dare retaliate. Stalin was kept in check largely by the American nuclear monopoly. The Soviets had no way of stopping it. They, they thought uh, supplying a city of two million people was impossible by air. They were wrong. Initially, the Western Allies were unsuccessful at providing the total tonnage needed to supply the city on a daily basis. But after the arrival of General William Tunner, an expert at logistics, the airlift quickly began to meet its daily goals. Tunner explained his plan. He would have planes land at three-minute intervals. This meant 480 landings in a 24-hour period. 
And this went on 24 hours. Never was there a stop. Constantly. In thunderstorms, in rains going sideways, in foggy skies, no landing lights. The sky was for a year, never without planes. Andre Scherny, author of The Candy Bombers, The Untold Story of the Berlin Airlift and America's Finest Hour, stated that in the spring of 1948, Germans said they would prefer a government that gave them economic security over one that guaranteed free elections, freedom of speech, press, and religion. It was not until the Soviet blockade and Western airlift that the occupation turned around. And they couldn't even move that flower. Every time they'd walk by us, they'd look at us like really eagles from heaven. And our perspective on them changed, too. We saw how hard they were working, saw how desperate they were, and saw them as, you know, not as Nazis but uh, or defeated enemy, but we saw them as uh, humans who were in need. Inspired by the grateful children he encountered in West Berlin, Lieutenant Gail Halverson began dropping candy and chocolate bars using parachutes made from handkerchiefs in what quickly came to be known as Operation Little Vittles. It spread throughout the airlift, forever changing the relationship between American pilots and the people of Berlin. And through the children, the eyes of the children, and the children's joy, the joy in their eyes for change, the stupid Sometimes the planes were coming and little things dropped down. We said, wow, what's that? We look candy. And he said, oh, wow. And it was just great Americans. So he, said, he dropped candies. And he said, told me afterwards, boy, it was much nicer than dropping, dropping bombs, you know. Halverson's operation and the compassion of the Americans began winning over the next generation of Germans. Some historians argue that the airlift itself did not supply and support the entirety of West Berlin, but acknowledge that this fact does not detract from the significance of the stand the U.S. took for the freedom of West Berlin. Berliners survived the blockade largely by doing what they had done in the years before, kind of going out into the surrounding countryside and making deals with farmers or trading on the black market. Near, near Berlin were farm farms, yeah. We sometimes were going uh, and visiting these farms and we said, could, could you give us some potatoes? And wherever we went, we got one potato. This creation of symbolic connections between Germans and Americans in particular, that really is, um, I, I think, the, the, the big outcome of the airlift. Um, it does suggest the power, the symbolic power, that goes even beyond the material benefits that, that were provided by the airlift. In December 1948, the political division of East and West Berlin was finalized as the West elected leader Ernst Reuter. The people of Berlin want nothing else than to be a free people. No dictatorship will stop our free election. On May 12, 1949, the Soviet Union ended the blockade of West Berlin. Stalin's blockade backfired badly, wrote John Lewis Gaddis in his book The Cold War, A New History, and won the Western Allies, the gratitude of Berliners, the respect of most Germans, and a global public relations triumph that made Stalin look both brutal and incompetent. By 1955, Germany was seen as a valuable partner, not the enemy any longer, but um, you know, a booming economy, a booming democracy, which is what we always wanted anyway, and a perfect symbol to the rest of the world that even the most evil you know, government on this earth can be overthrown and replaced by a really good one. Author Andre Cherny said the Russians never gained another inch of territory and never tried. Author Cherny states, In a country that had never had a stable democracy, we brought freedom and turned their people's hatred of America into love for this country, its people, and its ideals. Never before or since would America be so admired around the world and stand so solidly on the side of light. Taking a stand for Germany in 1948 created a thriving economy and a political alliance between the United States and Germany that continues to this day. The U.S. was able to claim an ideological victory in their battle against an oppressive communist regime without firing bullets or dropping bombs, but instead by sending planes delivering hope and life. <laughs>